Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of Vegan Proteins Muscles by Brussels Radio. My name is Giacomo. And I'm Danny. And this is our 86th episode. <laughs> So I did a thing this weekend. I did a warm-up show and honestly, it was completely spontaneous. I knew for a fact that my nerves were just really worked up with my competition prep and although I was in complete control of things on paper, mostly, I was starting to slip a little bit and I think I needed to make it more real for myself and start to get a little more serious about my stage presence. So I was like, you know what? If I go on stage, I'll make sure I do a routine, I'll make sure I get ready to nail my posing, and that was my reason for doing it. And it was a lot of fun, actually. The best part about it, which Danny laughed after the fact, was that I got such an adrenaline rush. I mean, I was on cloud nine after the show, which I didn't expect because I'm like, you know what? I'm nowhere near ready. I have another eight weeks before I even do an opener and I'm not even gonna close out my season until 23 weeks from now. I'm not ready. There's nothing to be excited about. I have so much more work to do. And since I haven't stepped on stage in 2015, it was a crazy rush. Other thing is I'm a lot less stressed out right now, which is kind of nice. So yeah, I went to the INBF South Shore Natural. The coolest thing about it was that there was support out there for me. Support backstage too, actually. Typically, and I'm gonna stereotype here, like the dudes in the back, like nobody's really talking to each other. Everybody's got their, I'm too serious because I'm very into my bodybuilding prep game face on. There's like a little bit of chit chat, but not actual support and socializing and like leaning on each other for like, yeah, we're all going through this crazy thing. And this show, every single competitor was super friendly, super supportive. It was, not only refreshing, I hope that I can get used to it actually. I enjoyed that backstage. And then when I went out there, I had my niece and my nephew out there. My friend Jim showed up, which I didn't think he was going to. My wife was there, my mother-in-law was there. And then afterwards we all went to our favorite restaurant, Veggie Galaxy to celebrate, which was the coolest. Other cool thing was that I competed in masters for the first time, which was, a nice feeling, actually. People so. don't know what Masters is. Why don't you tell them? It's... I am here, guys. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I keep waiting for you to like chime in and chat, but you're giving me like a blank face, probably because there's a lot for me to talk about with this prep, which is this whole episode. That's what it's going to be about. Is about this competition prep. The Masters division is for those who are 40 and over, and I just don't want to feel like the old guy, and I haven't been ready to accept my 40s, even though I've been here for over a year. I think truth be told for full transparency, cause love it or hate it, that's just who I am and that's what you'll get from me 99% of the time is honesty and transparency, honesty and transparency to a fault. I think that Danny wanted me to feel really celebrated when I entered my forties and she let everyone know that I was 40. She let everyone know that I was 40. And I think she had the best of intentions. She's like, my dude, my man, my husband, like he's gonna know how loved he is out there. We're gonna make the biggest deal out of it. And honestly, I think for like for a solid four months, I'm like, everybody knows how old I am and I feel old. And I don't think it's what she intended on happening, but it's what happened, it's how I felt about it. And I felt the same way about entering the master's division. I'm like, man, not only am I not a pro bodybuilder for whatever the reasons, it doesn't even matter. Now I'm gonna enter as a master's and I'm still not a pro bodybuilder. And I'm still doing this thing and I'm still working my butt off. And that's just depressing. That's just depressing. But honestly, it was kind of like a thing to be prideful about. And it was kind of fun to be like, I've been doing this so long and so successfully and continuing on that now I'm in the master's vision. That's cool. So. I don't know what to say. Anything, say anything. <laughs> what did you think about the competition? What did you think about the warm show, Danny? I thought it went well. Uh, you you performed better than I expected you to, honestly, having not been on stage for seven whole years. Um, it w- you, you looked better than I thought you were going to look. Uh, this, kind of, I don't want to say early into your prep because it's far from early, but like in the middle of what is going to be a crazy, long, ridiculous prep. 
Um, I thought you looked good. I mean, you didn't even do a peak week. Man, we are just diving into this topic, huh? Not introducing it at all. <laughs> uh, yeah, you didn't even do a peak week. You just showed up and, and did it. So what was that like? Well, I had to deal with the fact that my muscles were going to be depleted going to th- into the show. I had to also deal with the fact that my body went through a high stress response the two weeks before the show and got super watery to the point where I was literally holding on to, I would say a minimum of five pounds of water. In other words, to give you some context, I have been in like officially in prep for 12 weeks. I know Dana doesn't agree with that, but technically I've been in, in prep for about 12 weeks and I looked like I was prepping for only one week out there because of how much water I was retaining. And on top of it all, my muscles were flat. So that was a bit of an uncomfortable feeling. And I had to really go out there confidently knowing that it was more about being on stage than trying to look right on show day. But it was surprisingly fun to be in the experience. And also, also, this was a cool thing. I had a routine where I felt like I actually was out there performing something with some element of showmanship, whereas opposed to in the past, it was like, eh, remember your poses and hit them. And I did like the rigid grr, I'm just gonna like flex really hard and be really serious, but like put some music behind it. I'm like, no, not this year. You know, you get the privilege of doing a routine and know where their division does. You do this thing justice. You got there and like, so I hired a posing routine coach and she strung something together crazy fast. And then I just started playing the song over and over and over. And then I bought the sheet music and I looked at it to see if I could like piece it out in my head because I read sheet music, I'm a percussionist. And then I made it real and I went out there and I did it and it was just like the coolest. So overall, good experience, but it also casts a spotlight on what this prep has been like, which is like Danny said, what this show is mostly about. And obviously I still have an adrenaline rush because I jumped right into this thing. <laughs> so tell the people what they want to know. How is your prep been? Yeah. What, tell us about it. What does it entail? What did, where'd you start? Where are you now? Where are you going? What are you doing? Go for it. I'm just, I'm just here to listen today. Ooh, okay. All right. I'm, I'm all right with that. Well, I, I guess technically, if you count dieting down as prep, I started dieting down last year. I started dieting down before the holidays. I started off, if we're talking numbers, I started off around like 195, 200 pounds last year. And by the end of the year, I stopped out around 170 pounds. Then I just chilled out for a little bit and gave my buddy a chance to restore, actually even gained a couple pounds. And the last couple months, I started dieting down again. So that's been the trajectory of this prep. And a lot of mixed feelings here. We're both bodybuilding coaches. Uh, I've had a little bit of a hard time assessing it because I'm in it. And I think when you're in it, it's a little hard to do the intelligent, honest thing and criticize yourself and reflect reflect on your prep and think about what's going wrong, what's going right, what should have been done differently. Like I've been having a lot of problems accepting criticism from Danny, who's also a bodybuilding coach, giving myself the criticism that I should give myself because it's challenging. It's like part of you when you're actually in a prep, that well, it's the path of least resistance. It's the easiest thing to do is to just put the blinders on and do what you're told and trust the process because it gets hard enough just to execute and to execute well You don't want to second guess what you're doing. You don't want to stress yourself out more than you need to. But I I also think it's important to take a look at what you're doing and be like, what about this do you feel was done right? What about this do you feel was done wrong? What do you feel like this approach has been? You know, like I have a coach, so I can think about this and I can challenge my coach and make my own decisions and also have a high degree of autonomy. But... I still hired someone to follow their program, their plan, and their approach. And I have to give it an honest shot as well. So this is what I feel has been challenging is the fact that we are, we both have strong opinions on how things should be done. We both want to analyze and criticize to learn from this experience. And it makes sense to do it 
while the prep is happening. So honestly, I know you're mostly here to listen, but I'd really love to hear your thoughts on how this prep has been going and your feelings about what has been happening programming wise, approach wise, and how you feel like things should have been done differently or et cetera, et cetera. Way on in Danny. <laughs> um, yeah, I uh, I have lots of thoughts about this, but I, before we get into that, I'd like to hear a little bit more about what it is you've actually been doing. I mean, I already know, but I would think the audience would probably want to know what have you actually been doing? Gosh, I get so lost in details, especially when I'm excited about something. Let me see how I can simplify. What have I been doing? Well, the idea was to get my body in a good position starting point wise where I was really lean and my body wasn't stressed out and I wasn't stressed out and I had a chance to actually have my systems upregulate a little bit, meaning my mindset, myself physically. So it's like, all right, get yourself to like the lower end of an athletic body fat range and chill out and give yourself a little bit of a chance to breathe. And that was the end of last year, your meaning. Correct. Okay. So that was uh, that was like the end, the end, the holidays, right? So a little bit of a break from militantly tracking, not trying to get steps in, and not worrying about trying to get leaner. Having workouts that had more oomph behind them because I started to eat more, stuff like that. I did that for I want to say at least three months. I think. Anywhere from, what, December through the beginning of April, I want to say. So a good solid three, four months like that, just kind of coasting. And after that, we went full throttle and we went right to, okay, you're dieting down again. You're getting steps in again. You're training just as hard, except obviously you're training with less food and you're back in it. So I did all that. But this time around, I was able to take my maturity and experience as a competitor in this game and try to do things in a little more of a laid back way. And I did not get obsessive about tracking and I did not get obsessive about trying to do everything in a way that was like super safe, you know, in other words, eating patterns changing and I don't know, how do I explain this? I led my life as normally as possible instead of trying to be married to the idea of being in a prep. I did that for as long as I could. I started to get leaner. And then eventually I started to hit a wall where if I didn't find a way to be a little more dialed in on the weekends, and if I didn't find a way to make better choices with food, that probably wasn't going to make much more progress. And that's kind of where I'm at now. How many days a week are you training? Well, I've probably been training on average about four to five days a week, 45 minute sessions, no cardio, 10,000 steps a day. That's what my activity looks like. You did run that race with me. Yeah, I did. <laughs> I did that for you. I, I want to say I did that for us, but I also I feel like I mainly did that for you because it's not the smartest thing to do while you're prepping. But it felt really good to do something that I have personally wanted to do with you for a very long time. So that was actually a world of fun and something I feel like I can wear as a badge of honor that I was able to do that during a prep, actually. Where did your calories start and where are they now? Roughly weekdays, deficit days. When you say where did your calories start? Back when you started dropping in last year or what were your off season calories? Any specifics would be super cool. (laughs) Okay, totally. Off season, my calories are close to 4,000. When I started prepping, they dropped down to a little below 2,000. And then back in January, when I was at maintenance for a little bit, we bumped them up to like about 3,000. And we went back to dieting down, they're around 2,400 now. They're not quite as low as they were last year, but they are low and they'll probably get lower as we keep going. That's funny as a female to hear somebody say 2,400 calories on prep is low because mine get too low, (laughs) real low. (laughs) And uh, it's, it's just kind of funny, but it just goes to show like everybody's calories that they need to be stage ready. It's very, 
it's only relevant to them. Like everybody is a relative. It's only relative to them uh, and their hunger and their body's needs. So that's part of the reason you can't compare yourself to anybody else. But your weight started uh, last year at like 200, you said. And what are you right now? 165. Okay, so you've dropped 35-ish pounds which is also, I guess it's just over 20%. Uh, you lost about 20%-ish of your body weight or your off season is 20% over your stage weight, but this is not what you actually think your stage weight is going to be for the later shows, right? Right. What do you suspect it will be? I think I will drop down to the low 150s and I'll probably carve up to the mid to high 150s. Oof. <laughs> Uh, you're literally going to be like 10 pounds more than me. <laughs> Probably at the end of this. I'm not taking pictures with you at the end of this. That's for sure. Um, but yeah, man, that's, that's like literally like a solid 20 pounds lower than you've ever been on stage before. Right. How do you feel about that? Honestly, uh -huh. I've wanted it from day one, but I know that I've never had enough muscle on me to even entertain the idea. Technically I don't now, but I want the experience. So that of the experience of what? Explain. I want the experience of dieting down to get that lean while doing all the things you need to do to be on stage. What he's trying to say is that he wants the experience of getting absolutely peeled, shredded, peeled. Like looks like an anatomy project. Is, is that what you mean? Yes. Okay. Just trying to follow. That's fine. So you, you believe you're already leaner than you've ever been before, right? With this amount of muscle on me, correct. What's been different so far? I mean, most people would look at pictures of you from 2013, 2014, 2015 and say, yeah, that guy's shredded. That guy's competition shredded, but you want to be way more shredded than that this season. And so far you feel like you've done that to a degree. So what feels different about it? Would you say? Hmm. As far as the feeling of being that lean? Sure. Well, I'll tell you what feels the same. I still feel like I want to be leaner and that I need to work harder to get to see my final form. It's the madness of the sport. You're constantly looking at yourself as a never ending work in progress and giving yourself a minute to stop and smell the roses only after you've reached the finish line, which for me will be my season, right? On, I think I, it will be hard for me to know how I felt until it's like two, three months postseason. And I look at myself and be like, that's what it looked like. Yeah, that is true. That is true of every prep. Every single prep, you just constantly feel like you're not there yet. You're not there yet. You're not there yet. And then the season's over. And then a couple of months later, when you're, you know, a good, healthy 15, 20 pounds heavier, you look at it and you're like, huh, hmm, I guess I was there. Interesting. <laughs> Who knew? Wish I could have known that then. Wish I could have enjoyed this then. <laughs> uh, it's unfair. It's cruel, really, whoever designed this system. <laughs> yeah, it totally is. The things that I'm starting to be able to ruminate now on with you as well, which is oh, thankfully, because you've been like begging me to you, like, Giacomo, please, like, I am a bodybuilding coach. I want to geek out on this stuff with you. And I'm like, don't do it to me. I'm just trying to I'm keep- I'm so sensitive. <laughs> I just, I can't second guess myself. I'm fear of self-sabotage. Don't do it. I'm, I'm being human. I only got so much in me. Um, after this first show, I'm actually able to pick myself apart a little bit, which has been he healthy. Yeah, because guess what? Here's, here's the real deal. Those judges don't give a shit how sensitive you are. They, judges will straight up email you <laughs> like too fat, lose more in the glutes and hamstrings. And you're like, oh, oh okay, all right, cool, thank you. <laughs> so, you know, if you don't have a thick skin, like a really, really, really thick skin, this sport will demolish you. So, I don't know. I'm glad you're feeling a little bit more open to some feedback. I wouldn't even say criticism, just feedback uh, now that you've done the first show. So that's good. Well, I have my thoughts, but I don't want to overshare because I want to hear you and what your thoughts are. So I am curious to know what you think based on how I feel about my physique this year. This is what I think. I think 
that I'm 10 years in. Ten, so look, I've been lifting for 23 years of my life, but I've only been lifting for 10 years consistently. Now, this is a hard concept for people to understand. They're like, oh, dude's been lifting for 23 years. You should be jacked out there. You should have like 23 years worth of muscle. Wrong. Muscles do have memory. Yes, I have an advantage because I've lifted for 23 years of my life, but to have maturity, muscular development, and all that jazz, you need to keep compound, the gains need to compound. And the only way to do that is by lifting year after year with no gap in training consistently. Now, to reach your genetic ceiling and then like really tease it out and perfect your look, you're looking at 20 years, 15 to 20. That's my thought, just based on everything that I know. So it's been 10 years, I'm at the halfway mark. To reach your genetic ceiling. Mm -hmm. Because there are some people who literally seem to come in out of nowhere, train for 18 months, and just win an entire competition from start to finish. And you're like, how? How did that just happen? <laughs> this person just touched a weight for the first time a year ago. How is it possible? And listen, genetics do play a huge role. They play an enormous role, especially in bodybuilding, where it does not just, you know, they're not throwing you on a scale and weighing how much muscle mass you have and whoever has the most wins. It's not ditto body fat. It's, you know, the shape of your muscles, the insertion points of your muscles, the size of uh, your deltoid muscles compared to your erectors in your back. Like only genetics are going to change those factors. So when Giacomo says it can take 20 years to reach your genetic ceiling, that's like, that's the best you can be. So just keep that in mind that when it comes to physiques, we're all starting in a different place. Uh, Giacomo went out there and he, he did so, so well. He did so well. There were four guys in his class. Giacomo came in second. And then there were two in masters, same guys. And Giacomo came in second. So he came in second to the same guy in both classes. And he said, oh, was it close between first and second? And uh, Giacomo looked phenomenal, but it wasn't close because the other dude's shape was just untouchable. It was, there was nobody on stage even coming close to that kind of a shape. And did this guy also have awesome muscles and great conditioning and good posing and a good presence? Yeah, he had that and he worked for all of that. But that shape, man, to a large degree, that shape that people have, you have it or you don't. And I feel like it's kind of like an X factor, like an it factor. It's there or it's not. And that's a tough pill to swallow in this sport, right? Right, which is why you really have to be your own biggest fan. Mm -hmm. It's the thick skin is what you use. And outside of that, it's also the mindset. You really have to fall in love with what you are capable of because everything else will wreck you. And having a thick skin only goes so far. If you're not, in my opinion, if you're not passionate about the sport, if you're not in love with the idea of going out there with other competitors who have also worked their butts off and also love this. And like, if you don't love everything about it, you shouldn't be out there. So mm. I get Danny's point. Like, yeah, you need a thick skin, but not to the point where you're not fully present and immersed in this thing. Like how much of your life are you going to dedicate to something and not enjoy it for all that it's worth? That's my opinion. Yeah, I, th I don't think we're saying different things. I don't mm -hmm. think having a thick skin or not has anything to do with what you just said. Mm. But I, uh, yeah, you do, you do have to, I, I don't even want to say accept where your body is at. Cause I don't want to make it sound like you can't, you cannot change your shape. You can change your shape to a degree, but you can't change your bones. You can't do it. You cannot change where your muscles insert. You can't do that. I'll give you an example. I, I have two spots where like I'm super gifted or I'm sorry. I have one spot where I'm super gifted and one spot where I'm very disadvantaged. Just genetically, my lats insert very low on my back. They must, because when I flare them, even when I had just been lifting for a couple of months, I had a V taper. I had no business having a V taper. I, I didn't work for that. It was just there. Um, so that is a genetic just gift. 
that was bestowed upon me, my bicep insertion points, it's like they insert as close to my shoulder and as close to my elbow as humanly possible. So I have this like long skinny bicep. You know how some people flex and they get like what looks like a baseball in their bicep? Those are great bicep insertion points. Some people have longer ones. I have the longer ones. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the shape and the genetic components that you can't change. Some people have really wide rib cages. There's not a whole heck of a lot you can do about a wide ass rib cage, you know? Hmm. Um, so Giacomo has great legs. <laughs> he has really great legs. The insertion points all over his legs are fantastic. Um, historically, he has not had the best upper body, but this past couple of years, he's really brought so many parts of his upper body up a lot. Um, which has been cool, but there's also some parts of, you know, your genetics that are not always going to be favorable in a specific lineup to bodybuilding. And that's okay because you can still do really, really well on other rounds, you know, because there's different rounds of scoring in bodybuilding. Not everybody knows this. There's muscular size, right? And that is literally what it sounds like. Who has the biggest muscles? There's balance and symmetry. That's that shape we were talking about. There's conditioning. That's how lean you can get. You can control that. And there's presentation. You're posing your energy that you give off on, on the stage. You can control that. So, and I mean, you can control some things about balance and symmetry. Like if you have weak calves, you could bring those up. Or if you have small delts, you could bring those up. Um, but the shape is harder to change. So anyway, that's what I meant. Sorry, I went on a tangent there. No, it's important to drill that point and drive that point home. Drill it in and drive that point home. However, the part that I wind up getting into healthy debates with Danny on in regards to the shape and you only being able to control that so much is that I believe, I believe in the deepest way that you get to a certain tipping point where even though your genetics can be beaten by another athlete who can spend a lot less time working on the same thing you're working on, you get to a certain point where you have so much muscle on your frame and you know how to put it out there so well that although someone else has a better shape than you, at some point, at some point, you're going to progress from being an amateur to a pro. You may not ever be the best pro, but you can certainly s cross over into the next pool of talent and probably even do reasonably well, like middle of the pack, if and only if you continue to be like the absolute picture perfect of what your genetics are capable of. And that honestly, because without that thought, I don't think I'd keep doing this. You know, if I, if I thought that people could just come and mop the floors with me, no matter how picture perfect I was 20 years from now, I would, I would just, I would just walk away. I would walk away. Oh, see, that doesn't demotivate me at all. Like hmm. it's just, it's just the way it is. Some people are just going to be able to show up and knock it out of the park. And some people are going to work at something for sometimes their whole lives to be middle of the pack. I mean, honestly, I have more respect for that person than the person who just immediately was awesome at it. You know, I mean, that's how I feel. I'm still in awe of the physiques for sure. When I see it happen, I'm always like, oh my God, wow. <laughs> what is going on with the kids today? What's in their water? Um, no, just kidding. Um, but yeah, but I think that I, I personally think that you're going to build way more character when you're the second person than the first person. For me, what can I say? It is the side of me that is fiercely competitive and as much as this is a sport about the self, and to Danny's point, like you have more character and you work on it longer and it's what you can count on, you showing up as your most perfect self 20 years in the game, like I get all that. But I'm just gonna be real with you here. I'm just a very competitive person and I want to know full right and well that I could outcompete somebody with a better shape than me when we both show up there and I have more years of work on my body than they do. Like not only more years of work, but like I've also gotten to the point 
where it's a tipping point for me, where I've perfected what my body can do out there. I want, to me, that's the part of me that competes against the others on stage saying, look, this is where I am. Um, come on and join me and beat me when you're there as well, but, but I'm here today and I earned it and that's why I'm gonna out-compete your shape today because that's so interesting to me sorry sure. no 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 it's true uh, i feel like i need to get that out because i don't know if i've quite articulated it with you and this is something you and i debate over and over again and these are the things i that don't I, remember ever debating this no they're <laughs> the things they're the things that keep me going without this i don't think i would do it it's it's this it's the part of me that is outwardly competitive toward others interesting because i could give a rat's ass about beating the other people on the stage. I mean, it always feels good to win. Like that feels great. And maybe if I was consistently coming in low, maybe, maybe I'd feel differently. Um, but I really am, you know, on the day of the show, like on the show day, I think to myself, I'm going to outpose all these girls. Like I think that when I step on stage, like that's the goal. I'm going to be the one that's not shaking. That's moving smoothly. That's walking gracefully blah, blah, blah. But up until that very moment, it is 100% me versus me. 100. I just am trying to beat the girl that I was the last time I did this. And that is it. That's the only driving thing to me. Can I do better than I did before? Because what happens on that stage is a, a bajillion percent out of my control. Uh, it's I can go out there and be my best self and somebody out there could just be better and that's fine that's or, or the judges could just like not like brunettes that day like sometimes it just be like that it's okay <laughs> sometimes i'm in a lineup of all short girls and i'm the one tall girl so i look really funny out there as opposed to if it's all tall girls and there's one short girl she looks really funny up there so it it really just depends on what the lineup is. And in a sport that is as subjective as this sport is, to me, it has to be, am I better than I was last time? It, even within my season from show to show, did I peak better this show than I did last time? Did I get a better pump in the right places at this show than last time? So I don't know. I, I this is the I, you said we've debated this a bunch. I don't remember that. This is the first time I ever remember having this conversation. So this is all news to me, just as much as it is to you guys. Yeah, I agree with Danny wholeheartedly. By the way, that is um, what I do during. Well, honestly. <laughs> Funny, you and I kind of differ. When it comes to show day, leading up to, after, and during, I don't think about the competition. I don't want to beat them. I don't think that I'm going to outdo everyone out there. However, it is the thing that is driving me. It's like one of the things that drives me on the inside long term. It's like, it's my long term buy in. It's not just my buy in, it's my commitment to myself. And feeling like one day I'm going to earn like whatever, everything I've put in will have earned me the right to, to be there. No matter who shows up, I will win. It's me and my best version of myself and I can't control everything. And all that I'm focused on is what I can bring out there. And I absolutely love, adore and support all the other athletes. Like so much more these days, the deep more I get into it. Like I want to know about them, their backstory, what got them into it. I let them know like what parts of their shape I think are beautiful and really cool, like straight up, you know, um, one dude had an awesome upper body. The other dude had a really good shape and knew how to train in an age appropriate way, which I love cause I do that as well, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. Um, I don't know. Lots of stuff to think about, I guess. Some of the things that I've been doing now, to try to make this an experience that I can grow from that I haven't done in the past is I'm looking ahead. I'm looking ahead in a way where I practice what I preach to my clients. My mental health matters post-competition season. Uh, the stuff I've learned, I'm applying it and I'm actually trying to learn new things as far as, okay, like for example, we'll talk about my body image. You know, you get addicted to the way that you look and to the point where you can't even control it. And even though you know you need to commit to becoming a healthy person at a healthy body weight and actually at a body weight where you can bulk and gain more, 
it's easier said than done. It's hard on you mentally. So I've been doing all kinds of things this time around where it's like, you know what? I'm going to buy clothes, new clothes for myself that fit me at 195 before I'm even done with this prep. I want to enjoy fitting into clothes when I'm back to being 35 pounds heavier. I bought a pair of 36 to 38 inch boxers. I put them right in the front of my closet as a visual reminder every single day that although I'm going to be peeled to the bone, this is where I should be. And as silly as it sounds, those kinds of cues in your environment can help you commit to it after the fact when you're so invested in prep. Yeah. Dude, it's hard, guys. So we can do a whole separate episode on what it's like to be a bodybuilding fitness co- fitness coach in her full-blown off-season while her husband <laughs> drops 50 pounds. And I just sit here like, burp, 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 like I'm <laughs> just, just eating my normal food, being, you know, larger than is comfortable, honestly. Like, that's the thing about bodybuilding and building muscle in general, not even just competitive bodybuilding. When you're building muscle specifically, you feel bigger than you would like to feel. That is part of it. And watching Giacomo get shredded and shredded and shredded, and I'm just over here, full blown off season, middle of summer, living life in my maxi dresses, uh, feeling like, you know, I could diet. I could. It's so weird how that temptation to diet is like always dangling its weird, shitty carrot in front of your face. Like, I could get kind of lean too. I could just get like, you know, summer lean, not like bodybuilder lean, but like summer lean. And I could. I could do it. I could do it anytime I decided to do it. But on the flip side of that, there's so many. This is a totally different topic, but give me this for a minute. There's so many good things that happen in my body at this particular size that it's a hard, even though the the look, I prefer the look about 10 to 15 pounds lighter than I am. um, I am so freaking strong right now. I'm recovering so well in the gym. I'm hitting PRs that I've never hit in my life. I'm officially hip thrusting well over 300 pounds regularly now. I'm overhead pressing uh, the 40 pound dumbbells without even a spotter. Like I'm kicking them up by myself and doing them for every set. That's awesome. And I'm not worried about food. Like remember we went out to Veggie Galaxy and our buddy Jim was there and we haven't been there since I was starving at the end of a last prep. And I was like kind of picking at my food. I wasn't even really finishing. He was like, what happened to you? He was like, the last time here, he basically inhaled everything. Um, And I was like, I don't know. I'm just not that hungry right now because my body is not, my body is not food focused. My body isn't scrounging around for calories or anything like that. I'm able to, you know, participate in all of the things around me, have dinner with the kids. Um, and I think that's really important. That could be a whole other podcast episode. Ah, being a, a, an adult human person that diets while you're in like children's lives and how that can affect them and how you should be careful about how you do that around kids because you can really F them up for the rest of their lives if you're not careful. Ugh. So, you know, being able to, when the kids are having, you know, cook out vegan dogs and tater tots. Like I want to have cook out vegan dogs and tater tots with them so they can see their auntie, you know, eating with them, not sitting there counting her calories on her food scale, which by the way, the kids at the bodybuilding competition were so freaking cute. Oh my God. They cheered for Giacomo so much. It was a pretty small show, right? (laughs) And Giacomo's on the class with four in the class with four, four guys. And I say, you know, at first I'm cheering on Giacomo, you know, go Giacomo, blah, blah, blah. And then they turn, they quarter turn, they do something. And I was like, looking great guys. And Daisy looks at me and she's like, why are you cheering for people that are not Uncle Giacomo? (laughs) She's five. And I was like, well, because everybody up there worked really hard to be there. And it's nice to show support for everybody, right? And she was like, yeah. And after that, the figure and bikini girls came out, which I was a little bit iffy, like, oh, is this something that... Is this something I want her to see? But I realize it's only sexual if you make it sexual. It shouldn't be sexual. Whether the division is or not, we could talk about that all day. Um, Or divisions are, I should say. 
but I was also afraid of what Daisy was going to say or do uh, because some of the gals up there uh, probably could have used more time to get on stage. And I was afraid, you know, kids say the darndest things. I was afraid she was going to say something really loud that wasn't nice, trying to keep that down. But instead, what she did was she ran up to the front row, sat in the front row, and every girl that did her walk across the stage, she would cheer out. And if she heard their name from the announcer, she'd be like, you're beautiful, Jennifer. You have beautiful muscles. <laughs> It was the cutest thing and it was so good. And she said she wants to have muscles and uh, do a kid's competition. So we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. I have a lot of thoughts about that too. So yeah. anyway, I digress. Sorry. Tangent. Back to you and that you're buying was... clothes for your larger body. No, that was a really good tangent actually. And I really enjoy hearing your perspective as opposed to just blabbing on about this even though like obviously I have more to share and it's very exciting it's really interesting to hear your take and your experience based on my prep oh yeah so. it's hard it's really hard to go forward confidently in my off season while you are just like daily looking better and better and better I mean you're clearly not feeling better and better and better <laughs> so that's a nice little like oh yeah he feels like crap don't want that do 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 <laughs> Um, that's, it is challenging, but I'm sticking to my guns as best I can. I'm not saying I will never cut. I haven't dieted in four years, so I'm probably due if I'm being honest, but, uh, I'm not there yet. There's too much going on in my, in our world for me to really commit to that. And when I do commit to a cut, I commit to it. I'm going to do it. So, and I'm not there yet. So that's okay. Exactly. The other thing body image wise is the way into prep. I usually just like know that I'm going to look a certain way on stage and I get a taste for that and think about that. But I don't think about what I am going to look like and how I'm going to feel off stage. So this prep, I bought clothes where I wouldn't be swimming in baggy clothes or I wouldn't have clothes that didn't fit me well while I was on prep. And that has actually helped me mentally because it's crazy. You look sickly off stage if you don't, especially if you don't dress appropriately. I mean, it's bad enough you look gaunt in the face, but if you don't have the right clothes and you're just getting like crazy lean, like beyond what is considered normal, you start to look like crap if you don't dress yourself properly. So I've been intentionally buying clothes before I got lean that I could fit into and still feel like, oh, okay, I have some shape to me. I, you know, especially like being a dude and all, if you wear, if you have baggy clothes on and you're a lean bean, you just feel like you got no shape and no muscle. And that's a terrible feeling. So that's something I've done differently going in. Then the other thing, like Danny said, you think about, oh, you can get lean whenever you want. You could stay lean for as long as you want, which I've done in the past. And it's like, oh, we got a cruise coming up in February. I was like, oh, I'm not gonna be lean. So I've been planning my off season. I was like, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna bump up, bump it up. I'm gonna get to like 185 for the cruise in February. I wanna enjoy it. And then by like May, June, I'm gonna be back up to like in the 190s. And I'm saying that now and committing to that now and talking to my coach about it now because I want to focus on my mental health, which means I want to focus on my body image going into prep, during prep, and after prep, even while I'm in prep. The other thing is my eating patterns, right? This is one where, oh gosh, this is kind of challenging because I've committed to eating healthier foods than I typically do because I'm not eating as much. I'm like, you know what, I might as well get the most nutrition in, be the nicest on my body, right? Don't stress myself out with artificial sweeteners and flavorings and overly processed foods. Make sure you get your nutrition in. Your body will probably respond better if you treat it better. So I've been doing that. And I don't know if I'm gonna do that in the off season, but part of me kind of wants to challenge myself to see if I can continue to keep that up. But it's the eating patterns, Danny. It's, it's, it's hard to describe. I, I wrote it in my journal. I journaled and I'm like, I need to sit with that feeling where when you eat for a refeed or if you're just eating up for whatever reason, like you get that rush of endorphins and you get that body rush when you like physically have a ton of energy. Cause that feeling, if you don't sit with it, you will sabotage over and over again because you're just constantly overly hungry and your body gets a little surge of energy. It's like, huh, you mean I don't have to feel like crap? Okay, I'll eat more. That feeling when you're gaining weight is the worst feeling in the world because 
your body's systems are not restored yet and you still get that trigger every single time as you're gaining weight. So there's some control you need into the off season and I accept that and know that. And there's also some experience working here knowing it'll eventually pass. And I think I've committed to all that sort of ahead of time, like that whole process, just knowing full right and well, like I'm gonna get back to a healthier place. Um, I'm obviously gonna lay off the tracking afterwards a lot. And I am gonna give myself some wiggle room to not, how do I say this, to not be overly focused on, on processed foods and the nutrient dense foods and like setting up my eating in specific ways so that like I feel satiated even when my hunger signals are strong. Um, one other thing I think that I've done differently and well this prep is that in the past, I would give myself at least three or four gold stars, sometimes even five gold stars, whether it was the off season or prep, when I didn't feel my hunger signals. I'd be like, you know what? I don't feel my hunger signals because I'm stressed or I don't feel my hunger signals because I convinced myself that dieting down is the right move. And you know what? That's That's not a healthy way to be. You know, like I want... I don't want to feel my hunger signals to the point where I'm going to overeat, but I know for a fact that's not healthy. So, you know, I know that I'm hungry. I know that I'm going to be hungry getting out of this. And I'm going to, you know, keep that the narrative while still making sure that I eat healthfully, you know, the right food balance, the right kind of portions. I've been thinking about this stuff a lot. And I don't think I have too much else to share. Uh, I'm sure you'll hear more during the intros for future episodes, especially as we get deeper into planning plant built. Mr. America, Atlantic City, New Jersey, come October. And obviously I'm, I'll have a full-blown competition season where I'll be doing anywhere from like five to four to six shows, one in August and then a whole bunch in October, November, and we'll be with our whole plant build team, which is not just bodybuilding, it's powerlifting, it's Olympic weightlifting, it's kettlebell sport, it's CrossFit, it's a whole bunch of us doing a whole bunch of things getting together and as we get closer to that and we'll be launching a fundraiser soon probably next month there'll be a lot more to share moving on to our question and answer segment here we go how do people start lifting again after being sick it's been just over a week without working out. And when I try, I feel weak or tired. Should I push through? Motivation is definitely an issue. Mm. Yeah, the thing about being sick is that even after you're not full-blown sick, there seems to be like 10% of those sick feelings that linger on. And it's just like a thorn in your side. Then there's that thought of, oh, what did I lose out on? Because I've been sick for the past two and a half or week or so or whatever it is. And then there's the whole idea of, well, I'm sick, but I should still try to train as much as possible, right? So it's really challenging. We always play it safe and say, hey, you know, stick with what is smart and makes sense. If you're sick from the neck up and you decide to train, fine. If you're sick from the neck down, chances are that you're gonna be diverting your body's resources towards recovering from a workout as opposed to recovering and fighting off whatever you're experiencing, whatever sick you have. And that you're gonna feel crappier, it's gonna take longer to heal, and as you're healing, you're probably gonna be less motivated and have crappier sessions as you're getting better. So it's one of those things where you kinda of just have to let the sick play out and train accordingly. I think as soon as the body aches start to go away and like you're ahead of that, you can start getting back in some training and then just know that your sessions aren't gonna feel 100%, they'll probably feel like 50, 60%. And then when you get to a point where like you're still feeling like 10% sick for a couple weeks, your sessions will probably feel like 7,500% because you have to take a little bit of a break from training and so that momentum isn't there and like your body's not fully healed yet. So it's one of those things where I feel like it's, a, it's the way that it goes it's a part of lifestyle, like you're gonna get sick. It's like life happens, you're gonna get sick. No one is 100% of the time not sick. So you have to just think, factor that in and just make the right moves going in and getting out. This question's for you, Danny. I love my evening wine. I know alcohol is a big no-no to lose weight. Any good suggestions to help with my 7 p.m. craving? 
Um, so this is a good question and we should probably do an entire episode about alcohol. Honestly, if you guys want to hear that, you let us know. Um, so alcohol is not necessarily a no, no for weight loss. There's a lot of reasons to not drink alcohol, (laughs) many, many reasons to avoid drinking alcohol. But theoretically, if you can fit the alcohol macronutrients into your daily goals, you'll still lose weight drinking alcohol. Um, should you do that? That's a different question entirely. There, the, Some of the reasons why it can interfere with weight loss is if you get a little bit tipsy and then you decide you're not going to stick to your diet anymore and you don't have one glass, you have four glasses, or you find yourself, you know, elbow deep in the snack cabinet, then yes, alcohol is a no-no for weight loss. But outside of that, it's not a big deal for weight loss as long as you can work it in. And of course, you don't want to work in so much alcohol that you crowd out all the good stuff. But for an evening time wine craving, this is a far cry (laughs) from wine, Um, but I'm a big fan of dessert teas. So if you go into the tea section of a grocery store, sometimes they'll have like a salted caramel herbal tea or a chocolate mint herbal tea. And those can be a nice little treat at the end of the day. Another thing that's probably a little bit closer to, you know, a cocktail, if you will, would be a seltzer water with a splash of cranberry and a lime. That is really quite good. That's also great in any restaurant. If you're with a bunch of people who are drinking and you don't want to be drinking, seltzer, splash, cran, lime, very yummy. And if you, I don't, I haven't seen anything that's equivalent to the hop water, but for wine drinkers, But if you just like alcohol in general, um, I love beer, beer. I haven't sat on a patio and drank a cold one yet this summer, and I'm a little bit bummed about it, but I don't drink very often. So it's gotta be a special occasion for me to do that. But if you do like beer, there is a company out there called Hop Lark, like hops, Hop Lark, and they make these seltzer waters that taste like beer. It's really weird there. It's not like a non-alcoholic beer, which of course exists, but honestly, the calories are basically the same. So if it's just the calories and alcohol you're worried about, non-alcoholic beer, there's no point. Um, But it's just seltzer water, this hop water. So it's zero calories and it's delicious and not sponsored. I wish they would sponsor me because I could drink one of those every single day. But if you like beer, but you don't like 200 to 300 calories per 12 ounce beer, hop water, give it a shot. But if it's wine, I would say the sparkling water with crayon and a lime. You could even do like sparkling cider, um, like sparkling apple cider and mix it, just a splash of it in with seltzer water. That's probably a little bit whiny. So those are my my tips on that. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning into another episode. We would love it if you could rate us on whatever podcast app you are using. It really helps us so that other people can see our podcast and we can help more people. And if you have any requests or questions or anything like that, you can reach out to us at coach at veganproteins.com. You can contact us on veganproteins.com. You can reach out to us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Vegan Proteins and at Muscles by Brussels. And as always, we appreciate you. My name is Danny. And I'm Giacomo. And we will talk to you soon. Bye.